as the gardener prepares and clears the ground for the vine, so that it may grow and produce good fruit. Help us, O oh God, to prepare ourselves to meet with you in worship, that we too may grow and be fruitful. Amen. I do welcome you all to our Sunday service uh, this morning. Um, I hope you would enjoy the service, you would enjoy the reading of the word, the prayers, you'd enjoy the preaching as well. Uh, God bless you for listening to our message, to this message this morning. Let us pray. Father, we come before you. God, love and care of us all. Often we are like the vineyard that fails to produce good fruit. We acknowledge that despite the love and care you show for us, we failed to extend that same love and care to others. We are truly sorry that at times our lives are more akin to wild grapes than a vintage wine. Do not give up on us. Do not lay us to waste but prune away that which is dead. Clear away the stones that prevent our growth and rain upon us your living water that we may produce fruit worth of you. In your name I pray. Amen. I would ask uh, uh, Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the word of God from the book of Matthew chapter 21 verses 33 to 46. Praise the Lord. We've got another wonderful verse for you this week about the, uh, the parable of the tenants. Um, as Johnson mentioned, it's uh, Matthew 21, 33 to 46. Listen to, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard he put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect the fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent, another, then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end. They they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone the builders rejected have become the capstone the Lord has done, the Lord has done this and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this day, on, he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. And this is the alert word of the Lord. And we'll get Johnson back to share his message for the week. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you, Ben, for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, I'm going to share with you on the theme, Rebellion in the Vineyard. Rebellion in the Vineyard. A landowner planted a vineyard. It was huge and completely fenced in. It even had a watchtower to guard against outside attacks or wild animals. After a while, the landowner could no longer maintain this vast estate, so he leased it to the tenants and left it in their care. 
All he asked it in return was a share of the produce at harvest time. The tenants gladly agreed. When harvest time came, the landowner sent some servants to the vineyard to collect his share of the produce. High in the watchtower, the tenants saw the servants approaching. Instead of welcoming them, though and handing over their great rightful payment, the tenants beat one of the servants, killed another, and stoned yet another. Word reached the landowner. He was extremely displeased. He sent some more servants of his share and gain. Again, the same thing happened. Finally, the landowner decided to send his own son. They will respect my son, he thought. When the tenants saw the son approaching, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. And that's exactly what they did. The tenants killed the landowner's son. Rebellion is an ancient theme in the Bible. It is the story of Adam and Eve. It is the story of the Tower of Babel. It is the story of the children of Israel during the Exodus. And the result is always the same. Alienation, heartbreak, and tragedy. A joke is told of Al Gore, George Bush, Bill Gates, founder of the Microsoft and one of the richest men on earth, all arrive in heaven at the same time. They are greeted by the Almighty, who is sitting on his golden throne. First, the Lord spoke to God, asking what he believes in. I believe in the internet and clean environment, God replies. Very good, the Almighty says. Come sit near me. Then he asked George W. Bush the same question. I believe in cutting taxes and taking good care of the military, Bush replies. Excellent, says the Almighty. Come, sit next to me. Then God asks Bill Gates what he believes. I believe, Gates replies, you are sitting in my chair. There are times when all of us try to put ourselves in God's seat. There are times when all of us act as if we, the world is our fiefdom and we are supreme over all we survey. There are times when we become people who are bosses in those areas. We forget that everything we have is on loan to us from God. We are temporal tenants. We don't own anything. Even though we sometimes exist, if we own it all, everything ultimately belongs to God. There was a church located next door to a supermarket. Since the church was short on parking spaces, the supermarket was closed on Sundays. The church leaders asked the owner of the supermarket for permission to park in his lot. The owner's response was fine. You are welcome to use it 51 weeks a year. What about the other week? The church members asked him. That week, said the owner of the market, I will turn off the lot so you will always remember that the lot belongs to me, not to the church. So, good point. We act like owners when we are only tenants. This brings us to the second thing we need to say. Happiness comes to those who understand they own nothing. When you understand that you own nothing, you are just a caretaker. You are nothing. Sometimes I tell people, when they ask me, where do you work? I say, I'm a caretaker. Where? At the church. Because I don't own anything. I'm just a caretaker of God's things. These tenants in our lesson were greedy. They wanted everything for themselves and were willing and willing to give the landowner his fair share. So the landowner, on the other hand, was generous. He had given them control of his vast estate. They could have all of his abundance. All he asked was a share of their produce. Sounds like you and me, doesn't it? Sounds like the very person who has ever walked on this earth. God has provided us so abundantly with everything we need. He has given us everything. All he asks is a small portion of return. But we are greedy. We are really greedy. We want to withhold what is right for his. I'll say the happiest people who have ever lived are those who gratefully acknowledge the ownership of God. When you acknowledge the ownership of God, you say everything belongs to God. 
Everything else that we have is on loan. Life itself is on loan. The air that we breathe is on loan. Think about it. Someday it will be passed on to someone else. Don't you see? No matter how rich we are, if we are not rich to our God, we don't have anything. The vineyard belongs to him. Happiness is found in recognizing our places, his tenants, his stewards. But there's one thing more to be said. Jesus calls us to good stewardship. We have another important responsibility. Jesus asked the religious officials that the owner of the vineyard would do to the rebellious tenants. They had no difficulty in responding. You put those wretches to miserable deaths and lease the vineyard to another tenant who will give him the produce at the harvest time. That was their response. What will you do to these tenants? Little did they know they were condemning themselves with their answer. You see, the parable was about them. They had been entrusted with the spiritual care of God's people. Unfortunately, many of them looked upon it only as a job, a way of earning a good living, a source of prestige and power, and they forget that they were being given a stewardship. They were so set in their ways that they stood, they stoned the prophets who threatened their comfortable life. Eventually, they crucified God's own son. That's a warning to everyone of us involved in a religious work, whether as clergy, whether as laity, we have a responsibility in the vineyard of God. You can't help seeing the stewardship implication in this story. We are often like those tenants. We are tenants living in God's vineyard with service to render to him. And because we have been given such a great garden, we must see it all as belonging to him and our responsibility to share with it, with him. So we often treat the church as if we are doing it God's favor when we give. Sometimes when we give, we think we are doing God's favor to the church. Still, this parable would tell us that we Christians are obligated to retain considerable portion of all that God has given us from the vineyard. Now, not what you possess, but what you do with what you have determines your true worth, said Thomas Callison. God is indeed our landlord. And it all belongs to him. How about you? Do you say to the landlord, you are always asking for your rent? No, I won't pledge what I will give you next year. I'm not going to share the crop with you because I don't like one of your workers. You can say that to your landlord. So the whole matter of stewardship is what relationship we think we have with God. Here Jesus says that we are like a tenant and a landlord. A landlord who loves us so dear that he gives his only son to convince us of his love. And that is Jesus Christ. This is not our world. It's God's world. It's not our church. It's God's church. We are only tenants. We are only stewards. But sometimes people who end up in the congregation, who have been here for a long time, we have been in the church when it was started build, being built, they feel like they own the church. They feel like they own everything. But we are not. The church doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. We have the responsibility to return to him a portion of what is his already and to use what which we have received to his glory. So whatever we have, when we come here on church Sunday, that's why we always give back to him. We are saying you have given us life for these seven days when we're out, we are thanking you for giving us that life. And we are just giving a portion of what we have owned. And when we talk about thanksgiving, that's what we are saying. We are saying we are thanking you for what you have given us. And in return, we are bringing back all these things to you. Because we realize that we don't own anything. So the realization that we don't own anything is, is a way of you coming back and saying, thank you, Lord. For giving me everything that I own. For giving me everything that my life is just okay. You, I, I don't like anything because they've given me. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not want. Why? Because he's giving me everything that I have. I've been given the family. He has given me the things. When I look back into my life, I would say, when I look back into my life, when I was a teenager, when I was growing up, I never had all these things that I have today. 
but God has given them to me. Not to abuse them, but to use them only for the purpose of God's kingdom. May God bless us this morning. May God help us to understand who we are in relationship to the word of God. Who we are in relationship to what we have. What we, we possess. At the end, sometimes we get possessed by our possession. That we forget who we are. We are only tenants who are supposed to surrender everything to God. God bless you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. God plan the care and nourisher of the vineyard. We are the vines, leveling cage for to produce fruit, the fruit of love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness and generosity, faithfulness and gentleness, and self-control, fruit that is lacking in so many parts of your world. We pray for families the world over where love is in short supply. Thank you, Lord for the treasures of our faith, for the ancient scriptures, for a wonderful pictures of your kingdom, the wisdom of poets and prophets. But most of all, we thank you for the gift of your son who walked among us and preached the gospel. Make us open to him so that when we meet him in others, we will recognize and welcome him. We ask you this in his name. Amen. Now we are going to have our Holy Communion service Jesus said I am the bread of life all who come to me shall not hunger and all who believe in me shall not thirst with Christians around the world and throughout the centuries we gather in this uncertain and familiar time in warmth hospital beds, workplaces, around their, these familiar symbols. Simple, ordinary elements that speak of nourishment and hope and are freely given for all of our God's people. The peace of the Lord be with you and also be with you. Loving God, we thank you that you are as close to us as breath, that your love is constant and unfailing. We thank you for all you have created that sustains life. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, our comforter who knows our every need, even before we ask. So as we ask that you bless this meal before us, as a reminder of how you have nourished and strengthened our people, your people through all, all generations and in all places. And now in the silence, we remember all who are broken, all who are struggling, with ill health, job loss, exhaustion, anxiety, fear from the impact of COVID-19. All who are oppressed, all who are alone, cast aside, all who are hopeless and, and desperate, and all who are afraid to stand up and speak out, first ridicule and condemnation, For it is these very ones whom Christ invites to this meal of hope. And so in the tradition of our story of faith, we pray together the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father in heaven, our Lord be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us in the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forevermore. Amen. We remember on the night when Jesus and the disciples had their last meal together. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and gave it to the disciples. This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat as often as you do remember. In the symbol of the broken bread, 
We participate in the life of Christ and dedicate ourselves to being his disciples, finding ourselves in the midst of the brokenness and woundedness of life. In the same way, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to the disciples, saying, drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this as often as you drink in the remembrance of me. In the symbol of the wine poured out, we participate in the life of Christ and dedicate ourselves to being his disciples, giving ourselves to others so that they can come to know that there is always hope to be found. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us eat and drink together. You can now take the bread. The bread of Christ broken for you and me. And now take the wine, which symbolizes the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ, which is shed for you. Amen. Take and drink. We give thanks, loving God, that you have refreshed us at your table, strengthening our faith in these challenging times. Increase our love for one another. Open our eyes to see where you are at work around us. And may we continue to live out the hope we have within us with those and who are in need of hope today. In the name of Christ. Amen. Let us bring our offerings. Let us pray for our offerings. Father, As we continue to thank you for the love you have shown to us, we continue to bring a portion of what you have given us, a portion of realizing that we are only tenants, a portion of realizing that li our, the life we have is just on loan, a portion of realizing that everything that we have is on loan. And one day it will be given to others. May you bless this offering, Lord, so that it can be used in your kingdom. Bless every one of us. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>